a little bit about, uh, since for many of you this is your first visit to Radiant Images, uh, who we are. Um, as an organization, we've been around for about a decade or more, uh, started as a digital only camera rental house and progressed very quickly into the niche of being the guys that you would come to when you couldn't get something anywhere else. Uh, why? Because we will find it, we will make it, we will do whatever is necessary to give you the solution that's going to meet your creative objective. So that means we were working in stereoscopic cameras, in body-worn cameras, in all sorts of unusual technologies, uh, pretty much from the start. And as a result, many years ago, as it turns out, when people first started thinking about, wow, this VR thing is going to turn into something, uh, we were first to market there to actually deliver the solutions for the extremely early adopters, actually the innovators in that industry. So that's a little bit about who we are. Um, what I'd like to do first is to introduce Michael Mansuri, who's the co-founder of Radiant Images, and himself is actually quite the expert in virtual reality, having worked in it basically from the start. And um, we'll just kind of go through a little dialogue here and surface some of the interesting things that Michael has been doing. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending. Thank you very much. Thank you. So before I start, I just want to say none of this would be possible without the innovative thought process and um, dedication to perfection of our employees. And um, also our partnerships with our uh, partners like AMD, uh, Jaunt, Nokia, Dysonics Audio, and VR Live. So I want to thank them for, for that as well. Awesome. Um, so in terms of where we are at in VR, could you give us a little sense from your perspective being a very hands-on guy in, in the capture as well as post-production and delivery side, um, what you've seen, say, in the past four months, the evolution of the industry? Um, it's, it's very surprising how um, VR has expanded. Um, early on, I must say, just like everyone else in this room, we were skeptical. We didn't think that it would be as big as it is. Um, but we've seen such a huge surge in uh, content delivery and really interesting content. Not just, um, let's just put a camera in a room and look around, but how do we tell different stories? How do we do things that are just completely, truly innovative, groundbreaking, and things that are completely outside of entertainment sectors as well, like education, like social impact projects. And that's where we've seen most of uh, more interesting projects come in as well. All right, now since we are really um, supporting the Hollywood industry, the mainstream studios as well, um, what have you seen lately in terms of how studio level productions are integrating VR? Well, I guess the best case would be um, Suicide Squad. So Suicide Squad came to us almost a year ago. She came to Sinclair. And um, they had a very challenging production, which is tell a story from my perspective allow our viewers to become those characters. And I think we told them it's impossible. Um, but we thought about it for a little bit and we figured out a way to make it possible for them. And I think what was interesting is how they're using virtual reality to help them promote their movies or tell additional stories inside those stories. Um, right now we're working with a couple TV shows, a couple other studios that are looking at other explorations inside those stories. So the narrative goes, the traditional 2D narrative goes, and then there's other sectors that your viewers can go inside and explore the sets and see a deeper meaning from the, or different stories from the director. So one of the things that I scream loudly at people about is that virtual reality is not a replacement for traditional frame cinema. Um, are you finding any occasions where people are saying, should this be framed or should this be VR, or is it both at the same time? Um, I think it should be both at the same time, but I think I think it's important to also I was asked questions, why do we need to look around? A lot of times we just shoot VR because it was dictated, but if we have no compelling reason why your viewers need to look around, I think the answer should be no. I think it shouldn't be a gimmick. I think it should be, it should drive a reason why you need your viewers to look outside the 16 by 9. There's a powerful thing that happens with film. It's the intent of I want you to look at something really close, at, and I want your audience to just look at this. And I think in VR, we want audience to also ex uh, opportunity to explore inside these worlds that we create from. And I think there's a difference in that storytelling. Certainly, and that I think for a lot of people 
becoming content creators early on in VR has been a challenge, is understanding how you can use the camera in motion. And that's something that you've dealt with a lot of productions on. Uh, how have you counseled directors and producers with regard to moving the camera? Well, we used to tell them it's impossible. <laughs> um, but we had a project with Brain Farm, and I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Brain Farm, but they don't do anything that's traditional. Everything is action sport. They typically shoot for Red Bull. So nothing they do is stationary. So it was really hard to convince them that you're gonna create motion sickness, people are gonna get really um, disoriented. But you know, in that process, we actually thought of solutions. So sometimes our first gut instinct is to say no, but we always ask internally, but what if? And that what if meant, how do we create solutions for them? And now I can honestly say that we can. There are some safety rules or there are some rules that we need to bend. Um, and I think there's, uh, the best analogy was actually uh, what we did with Brain Farm because nothing we did in Brain Farm was static. It was constant moving. But we stabilized the cameras. We used the right camera solutions for it and uh, it was very successful. So that does kind of bring up the question of the types of cameras that you can use and putting them in motion and stabilization. Um, what kinds of cameras are you finding are most useful for those dynamic moves? Um, I think cameras with global shutter and high frame rate. So the cameras that we've traditionally used right now, um, we advise our uh, content creators to use all the time, are Jaunt and Nokia for those kind of actions. Excellent. That's something we'll be talking about a lot more is uh, both where Nokia is at as kind of the, the senior camera within this industry as well as the uh, jaunt camera, which is the uh, newer player in town, at least from the accessibility standpoint. Um, so the reliability of the camera systems, how has that been in, say, the, mm. the past four to six months? I think that's where the biggest revolutions happen in for content creators is the reliability and purpose-built cameras. In the past, we've, we've had to create our own camera solutions, which is typically based on strapping on a bunch of GoPros together, they overheat. They're not meant for this kind of rough, um, dependable production shoots. Um, we found, especially with uh, production companies like Camp4 and uh, Brain Farm, they're taking their viewers into isolated parts of the world that even 2D cameras have a hard time keeping up. And with Camp4, we had a Mount um, Emelis, and we had it at, in, in Nepal and Alaska where it got snowed in for like two weeks. We couldn't even get a helicopter to search them out. <laughs> um, but the cameras came back with beautiful images. Awesome. Um, so one other point that uh, we should probably touch on is we are at the point within virtual reality where we have post-produced content which is accessible on demand, but we're also seeing a lot more activity and demand from the clients for doing live events. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the types of live events that you've been covering? So I think one, one thing that could be very exciting for content creators is also be, having the ability to live capture and live stream your content. Um, you don't have to take your content now and go to a lengthy post-production process. We can, for some of your content, capture live and stream it directly to any mobile device. And um, Best uh, case was what we did for Indy 500, which we just finished. We actually did a live stream, live capture, and we allowed users, the viewers, to choose different areas they want to be engaged in. So it's no longer being somewhat directed for them. We're creating the world for them, allowing them to explore in those worlds. So they could be on pit crew, they could be on flagpole, they could be right on the grandstand. So it gives them a much more interactive experience, and I think that's the real future where in VR is interactive cinema, where you put your viewers inside these worlds and they get to work inside these worlds. I think that's one of the most groundbreaking things we've done in live capture. Certainly, and when we think about it from an economic standpoint, uh, so many live event producers are confounded by the problem of you only have so many seats that you can populate with people, and if you're popular enough to have more demand than you have seats, the ability to actually bring in an additional layer of fans to that experience, or maybe even a differentiated experience, one that is better than you would get if you were sitting in the stands, is something that we are now able to do with virtual reality cameras. So.